In the darkest days of the Civil War, a poet had a son who was serving in the army. And the poet, whose name was Longfellow, wrote a poem that later became a Christmas carol. Some of you may know it. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, the old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more wild and sweet. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. Our Advent hymn for today, which is uh, the second in our Advent series, is called All the Earth is Waiting, and it has similar roots to the Longfellow poem. While Longfellow's carol has a backdrop of the Civil War, our Advent hymn has a backdrop of World War II and then the civil unrest in South America of the 60s and 70s. All the Earth is Waiting is written by a Catholic priest by the name of Tale who lived in Spain, and it was originally written in Spanish, by the way, and was educated in Italy just after World War II. So he lived through World War II, and he had personal experience of life during wartime. Now, for those of us who have parents or grandparents who lived through World War II, or some of us here may actually remember World War II, you know that it was a defining moment for that generation. It affected their lives from that point forward. And the same is true of these poets. Neither Longfellow nor Talley were personally involved in the wars, but they had deep relationships with those who were. And in both cases, the poets in their songs grieve the evil they see in the world, the hate, the wrongdoing, the mockery of good, the violence, the injustice, the bondage, and the despair. And in both cases, the poets find their hope in God. Sounds like songs for our time, don't they? <coughs> but Talley takes many of these ideas, of the, uh, for the ideas in his hymn, um, from Isaiah 40, which is our lectionary reading for this morning that Jim just read. And Isaiah's words are exactly what the poets were longing to hear in those violent days. Isaiah writes, and I'm using an older translation than Jim here, because I just heard this sung and handles Messiah, so I've still got the King James rattling around in my head. Um, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley will be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low. The crooked straight, the rough place is plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And when the mouth of the Lord speaks, things happen. You remember that in Genesis. God says, let there be light, and light happens. So when God speaks, it happens. This is what the hearts of our poets are crying out for. And is this not the message that our own world needs to hear and is longing to hear. And Isaiah continues, a voice says, cry, and he answers, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and its goodness like the flower of the field. The grass dries and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord stands forever. So go up on a high mountain, Zion, bringing good tidings. Lift your voice without fear and say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with a strong arm to rule. His wages are with him, his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those with young. So the passage in Isaiah is not all sweetness and light. It speaks of the end of the world as we know it. It speaks of a time when people will be rewarded for what they've done, for good or for evil. And then a new world begins where God will gather the lambs in his arms and wipe away the tears from every eye. So the coming of the Christ child 
is the beginning of the end for the powers of this world. And the powers of this world know it. That's why when Jesus was born, King Herod wanted so badly to put an end to that baby in the manger. Why, when the wise men returned to their country without telling Herod where Jesus was, Herod ordered the slaughter of all the baby boys under the age of two. The powers of this world don't like being told they're only temporary and their replacement has arrived. With this prophecy in mind then, we turn to our song for today. And follow me along, follow along with me as we go. Verse one opens with the words, all the earth is waiting. And it sure is. I mean, as Paul write in Romans, writes in Romans, we know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only creation, but we ourselves, while we wait for adoption. All the earth is waiting. This is the definition of Advent. Waiting for the Christ child to arrive and waiting for King Jesus to return. Waiting to see the promised one. Open furrows await the seed of God. The poet takes his word pictures from the farmlands of Spain and South America and from Jesus' parable about the seed and the various types of soil that it lands in. The seed is the word of God, that is Jesus. And the open furrows are the hearts of the people who prepare for the arrival of Jesus by waiting and watching and praying. And the song continues, all the world bound and struggling seeks true liberty, it cries out for justice and searches for truth. Now if these words sound like something from the protests of the late 60s, they are. But we can still find meaning of these words in our own time. Our world is indeed struggling. We see this on the news every day, even on Facebook. Our world is bound, as Pastor Matt said in his letter this month, which you may, I don't know if you all got that yet or not, but the, the congregation or the, the newsletter letter that goes out, he writes this, he says, all around us, we see folks in slavery to greed, to lust, to pride, to violence, to anxiety, to alcohol or other drugs, and most sadly, to despair. With our poet, our hearts long for freedom in a better world. And so we go on to verse two. The prophet says to those of Israel, which means to all God's people, a virgin will bear Emmanuel, which means God with us. This verse is a direct quote from Isaiah chapter seven, where the prophet Isaiah says, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. In verse 3, the songwriter turns back to Isaiah 40, where he writes, Mountains and valleys will have to be made plain. Open new highways, new highways for the Lord. And this is a quotation both from Isaiah 40 and also from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In Matthew 3, for example, Matthew writes, In those days... John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So Matthew quotes Isaiah 40, and so do Mark and Luke in their Gospels. And what these passages make clear is that John the Baptist's ministry is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. John is the one Isaiah, Isaiah predicted would go before the Messiah, whose voice would cry out in the wilderness. And the raising of valleys and the lowering of mountains is a metaphor that stands for repentance. Jesus' mother Mary sings about the same thing in Luke chapter one in her great Magnificat when she says, he has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts he has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. So there's a double meaning here. If we look at John the Baptist's message, which is a message of repentance, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now this is 
the spiritual interpretation of the valleys being lifted and the mountains being lowered. So for those who know that they're sinners and who are lowly of heart, as Isaiah would say, or who are meek or poor in spirit, as Jesus would say, will repent of the sins of self-reproach and fear and will be forgiven and will be lifted up. And those who know that they're sinners who have been puffed up or proud or rude will confess their sins and will be forgiven and will be permitted to return to their proper place. And so the ground becomes level. The second of the double meanings is found in Mary's message, and that is the repentance in society, where the needs of the poor will one day be filled and the wealth of the great ones will one day become meaningless and the ground becomes level. Now, I do want to warn against one mistake that crops up sometimes in the interpretation of this hymn. The wording the songwriter uses in verse 3, for example, mountains and valleys will have to be made plain, may lead people to believe that we need to get busy lowering mountains and raising valleys. But that's not our job to usher in the second coming of Christ. And this thinking began to to sort of become popular in the middle of the previous century, where there were two equal and opposite social movements, one on the left, one on the right, echoes of which are still with us today, that made this mistake. Both were built on what was originally biblical principles, but both became movements that were willing to use political power and force, if necessary, to achieve their goals. But both are mistaken because they try to bring in God's kingdom through human power. In other words, they believe if we properly set the stage by perfecting our society, then Jesus will have to return. And that's not what the Bible teaches at all. The Bible teaches this world will continue to be a mess until Jesus comes back. God's kingdom will arrive in God's timing, by God's power, in God's way. It's not our job to remake the mountains and the valleys. That said, Isaiah's words still stand. There will come a time when the high will be lowered and the low lifted up and the crooked made straight and the rough places plain and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, which takes us back to our hymn in verse 4. In a lowly stable, the promised one appeared. This is the heart of Christmas. God so loved the world that he gave us his son. Jesus left the glories of heaven to become one of us, to live and die like one of us, to experience all the joys and sorrows of life here on earth. God with us. And we still feel his power and presence in the world today. And as the song says, God lives in all Christians through the power of the Holy Spirit. But that's almost beside the point because it's not primarily through us that God sets the world free. We have the privilege of sharing in the work of heaven. We do our part to care for others and set people free because as children of God, we are learning to become more and more like our heavenly parent and to walk in God's footsteps. But Jesus is the one who sets us free from captivity to sin and death. So our Advent song for today is not an easy song to sing. It talks about hardship and heartbreak, captivity and injustice. It reminds us that our world is full of great need and it calls us to work to meet those needs. But I think the songwriter's hope in writing this hymn was that we would find in it a sense of expectation, that we would look forward to the promised one who is God with us, who comes in the virgin's womb, who comes in the stable, who comes on earth today, who comes in all Christians and who is with us now, and that we would see Jesus as a bringer of liberty and justice and truth. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. So during this season of Advent, let's prepare for the coming of our Lord Jesus by repenting of sin, and not ours only, but also the sins that we see in the world around us. When we read the newspaper or watch the television, we can bring what we see to God in prayer 
and pray for the day when the world will be set free from captivity to sin. We live in the now and the not yet. Jesus has come. Jesus has won the victory, and we are set free. But the mopping up operation isn't over yet. And so be watchful while we wait. Thank God for what God has already done, and thank God for what is yet to come. And keep watch, because the King is coming. Amen.